Hi, I'm Derek Jensen. This is Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. My guest today is Melinda Tankard Reese. She's an author, speaker, media commentator, blogger, and advocate for young people. She's best known for her work addressing sexualization, objectification, harms of pornography, sexual exploitation, trafficking, and violence against women. She's author editor of six books, including Getting Real, Challenging the Sexualization of Girls, Big Porn Incorporated, Exposing the Harms of the Global Pornography Industry, and Prostitution Narrative, Stories of Survival in the Sex Trade. An opinion writer, Melinda has appeared in ABC's Q&A and the Gruen Sessions, as well as many other TV and radio programs. She's co-founder of the grassroots campaigning movement Collective Shout for a World Free of Sex of Sexploitation, exposing corporations, advertisers, and marketers who objectify women and sexualize girls to sell products and services. An ambassador for World Vision Australia, Compassion Australia, Hager NZ, and the youth mentoring body raised the found I'm sorry, the mentoring body, the Rays Foundation. Melinda is also a senior lecturer in the Center for Culture and Ethics, Notre Dame University, Sydney. Melinda is named in the Who's Who of Australian Women and the World's Who's Who's of Women. So first off, thank you for your work in the world. And second, thank you for being on the program. It's my pleasure to be with you, Derek. Thank you so much for the opportunity. So much of your work has to do with um, the effects of pornography on young people. Like you have an article called Growing Up in Pornland, Girls Have Had It with Porn Conditioned Boys. So can you start by talking of some of the talking about some of the effects of pornography on young people and what you mean by young people? Sure. Well, I believe that we are engaging in a never before seen experiment on the healthy sexual development of our young people. My work with young people is primarily in secondary schools. Some high, some primary schools also and some university students, uh, but it's mostly secondary high schools uh, around Australia. And what I'm noticing is that things are getting worse. The stories that girls are telling me are getting worse and they're getting worse younger because of what I believe is socialising and conditioning of attitudes and behaviours through through pornography. That's become their primary sex educator, but it's giving them very harmful ideas about sexuality, about relationships, about about their bodies. And girls are being trained to see themselves as sexual service stations for men and boys, and boys are learning a sense of entitlement to the bodies of women and girls because of what they are seeing mostly online on pornographic websites. And first off, when you when you say prim, primary is what does that mean in Austra in Australia? Oh, Australia, this would be uh, up to about the age of eleven. Uh, so we have six years in pr- primary school and then uh, six years in high school. So, I mean, to be clear, and then we're going to talk about some of the forms this takes in a moment. But to be mm. clear, you're talking about the sexualization, objectification, not only of of like high school girls or college age girls, but you're, I mean, 11, you're talking children. Yes, correct. And I'm being asked to do more with the younger students. I didn't set out to do that, but because of the influence of porn, because children are being exposed at much younger ages. Uh, these days, parents are telling me their child was exposed at six, seven, eight years of age uh, because of pressure on even primary girls to send uh, naked pictures, nudes, naked selfies. Uh, I've I've been doing more of these talks at, at the primary school level, which, as you can imagine, is very is very distressing. These children shouldn't be having to navigate a sexed up world. They shouldn't have to be told uh, that porn will be harmful to them, or they already know that because many of them have suffered trauma as a result of being exposed to it. Just a few days ago, a parent told me that her five-year-old son had his head uh, forced into uh, a phone to look at pornography by an older boy. He didn't want to see it, and uh, now he's in the care of a psychologist as a result. So, as I said, the stories are getting worse, and they're getting worse younger, and we have no choice but to uh, engage with our young people to try to to protect them 
from these uh, harmful messages. It's not a, a matter of if my child will see porn, it's a matter of when, it's inevitability. So I grew up before computers and mm. um, and porn was simply not a part of my life at all. And mm. I'm gonna I'm gonna read a quote from from the article I just mentioned growing up in Pornland. But before we do, um, there's I want to clarify something. You say a year eight replied, and I just looked mm. that up. And a year eight that means in the United States a seventh grader, right? Yes. So this is somebody who is uh, twelve, thirteen, somewhere. Yes, there? about that. Yes. Okay. So asked, how do you know a guy likes you? A year eight replied. He still wants to talk to you after you suck him off. And yes, correct. I just I just have to say that in seventh grade, I probably would not have even known what that meant. No, no, you and I were both fortunate in that regard, Derek. So girls are telling me that uh, boys are pressuring them to engage in sex acts that the boys have viewed in pornography, including at school and girls are paying for tokens of affection through providing these porn inspired sex acts to give you another example uh, a 15 year old told me that a boy said to her uh, if you if you give me oral sex I'll give you a kiss a- another 15 year old told me on a friday night she just wants to uh, hang out with her boyfriend and watch a movie but she says, I have to get the sex out of the way early, otherwise I won't be able to settle down and watch the movie with him. So girls are expected to provide these acts to then get the sort of, quote-unquote, you know, more romantic experience or, you know, the meal out or the hand-holding or, or the kiss uh, because of what the boys expect. So I'm going to I'm going to take this a little bit different direction for a moment. Yeah. And <clears throat> I was thinking about this today. I'm I'm of an age where I have to wear reading glasses and mm. there was a comedian I saw a couple years ago on television who made an offhand joke about how he was just doing silly things with reading glasses and and basically there was this one throwaway joke where if you wear reading glasses on a chain that's a terrible fashion statement, and what you're saying is, I'm never going to have sex again. <laughs> and right. yeah. I wear reading glasses on a chain, and mm. I have to tell you, two years later, from that one joke, today mm. I went to the store to buy some stuff, and I was I thought of that line. My point is, that's one joke one time, and it still affects, and it's a joke, it's a stupid joke, and it still mm. affects how I perceive myself walking through a store. Yes. And, and, and so if, if something as silly as one throwaway joke is going yeah. to affect my, uh, self esteem two years yeah. later, what, so you see where I'm going with this. So just take this where yes, you want. Andrew, yes. Yes. Well, our children, our young people are being bombarded with, hypersexualized imagery, not only through porn, but through porn culture and advertising billboards, um, marketing, through everywhere they look, really. It's the, the backdrop of their their world, the environment that they're growing up in. And, and, of course, these messages will affect the way they see themselves. I have girls telling me that they're now being ranked on their bodies based on the bodies of porn stars. You know, boys are giving them rankings at school, uh, judging them on the basis of how they compare to a porn star. More girls think that their pubic hair is disgusting because boys tell them that. Boys are used to seeing, you know, hairless women in in pornography. And, of course, this is going to affect the way that uh, girls, young women feel about themselves. It, it, it harms their sense of self their body image, their confidence, it's its chipped away on a daily basis because they feel they can't compete with what the boys are seeing on online, you know, the, the, the big the big breasts and um, the hairless vulvas and the the way the women are styled and and positioned. 
And what a tragedy that our, our girls have been reduced to the sum of their sexual parts and aren't valued for other aspects of of themselves. And we're seeing this play out in rising rates of mental health problems and body image dissatisfaction, depression, anxiety, a suicidal ideation, self-harm, which are on the, the rise in girls, certainly in Australia, 14, 15-year-olds. You know, everyone's acting as if this is some kind of mystery. There's no mystery to why our young people are suffering. To me, the mystery is that any of them, you know, make it through on the other side. And the research is really solid on this. A, a global meta-analysis in 2016 found that objectified portrayals of women uh, lead the viewer to have a diminished view of women's competence, morality, and humanity. So women are le- seen as less competent, less moral, and less human. And we know, don't we, Derek, throughout history, what happens when any uh, subgroup of, of people are seen as, as less than human. You can do what you want to them. And we are seeing this play out, and our children are, you know, the canary in the coal mine in, in this story. And we've allowed this to happen. We've allowed this to be done to them, that children are seeing torture porn, rape porn, sadism porn, incest porn, and, and they think this is what normal sex is like. You know, the most popular genres are the most, are the most violent. What, what a tragedy. We've allowed this to happen to our kids. So I'm thinking of a line by Gail Dines about how <clears throat> once upon a time you had individual, uh, pedophiles or individual perpetrators who would yeah. groom their victims and yeah. now we have an entire culture that is yeah. grooming the the children exactly yes cultural grooming of our children is the the perfect way to to express that normalizing them to 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 pornography and to to porn culture which is embedded at, at, at every level of, of society, infusing the culture with sexualized representations of girls and women. So everyone comes to think, well, well, this is normal. And that cultural climate shapes attitudes, which shapes behaviors, which fuel the mistreatment of women and girls. You know, this is a, a, a continuum. If we allow boys to be uh, raised with a sense of entitlement to the women, to women and girls. Obviously, that's going to harm those women and and girls. And you know, we're, we've raised our boys with this very um, calloused and brutal idea about about masculinity. So, more of my work now has is is with boys and with young men to help them try and see how uh, porn will not enable them to have healthy respect-based relationships, how it will give them uh, brutal ideas about what it is to be men and trying to help them to aspire to something better, to resist the toxic scripts of pornography, to see how porn will will harm them and to help them reimagine something better because I think that it's it's only going to be when our young people uh, rise up and demand something better that we'll have a hope of of changing this because the porn industry is preying on our on our children. So you you've you've pointed out some of the ways that um, pornography can uh, groom um, girls into being um, groom boys into perceiving girls as sexual providers mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. Um, can groom girls into perceiving themselves that way. And can you yes. talk about, um, you mentioned the word relationship, and can you talk mm-hmm. about what uh, porn does to relationships? Well, it is it is absolutely counter and, and contrary to to a healthy relationship, and this is what Girls are, are telling me. Uh, you might have seen this Dare to Care report out of the UK by the Labor MP Sarah, Sarah Champion. She surveyed young people in, in her district and uh, one boy said, quote, 
If I have a girlfriend, do I need to strangle her when I have sex with her? This is the expectation now. They see strangling and they see choking and they think that that's what girls want and what girls like. And, of course, that's not the case. What I'm hearing more of now are choking injuries in in girls because of what they're expected to have uh, done to them. We've seen research about uh, coercion in relation to uh, anal sex and anal injuries in girls and young women. Uh, that's not what a healthy relationship looks like. We're seeing more young men now being charged with sexual crimes. You may have seen this research out of uh, Ireland the number of sexual offences recorded in the Republic of Ireland has doubled since 2003, an increase of 87%. Two-thirds of that increase has occurred in the past three years, and authorities link the sex crimes to porn, especially amongst teen boys, with 45% of sexual crimes now being carried out by juveniles. So, the, of course, they can't have healthy, intimate relationships when they think that girls uh, will want to be um, battered and, and, and choked and have a hardcore acts um, done done to them. And uh, this is uh, fueling not only vi- violence in intimate relationships, but, but, but further beyond that relationships as well, as well. I don't really know how to bring this up, but it, 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 one of the things that, that is breaking my heart as you're saying all this mm. is I'm thinking about the, um, okay, I'm a, I'm a childhood sexual abuse survivor within my family. And so right. I know that there, I know, I know about that, but, mm. but set, setting that aside, I mean, there, there still remains for some of us, myself included, sort of, there, 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 there's a cliched beauty of, you know, sort of discovering mm. sex, discovering sexuality and exploring sexuality with, you know, that, 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 all, all the cliches we've ever heard about young love, you know? Yes. And, yes. and, and I, I'm, as well as the tangible, I don't mean to diminish the tangible specific harm to mm-hmm. these young women, especially, but the, the, the or young boy, young girls and the boys also, but there's also yeah. this loss of, God, this sounds so cliched, but this loss of innocence that is that is heartbreaking yes. as well. Yes, absolutely, we should be heartbroken. Donna Hughes, you know, she edits the Dignity Journal. She published a piece recently where young men were interviewed about their porn use, and some of these men were using or had used up to six to seven hours a day. And probably the most heartbreaking comment in this report was one young man said that we're not aroused by skin-to-skin contact. Uh, we see a computer, we see an inanimate screen, and we get turned on. To me, that was one of the saddest things I've ever read because uh, I don't know if you recall the first time you fell in love and that that intimate feeling, that sensual, the sensuality of the, the, the hand brushing the the hand of the uh, one who was uh, adored. You know, the the boys are, are losing that now. Uh, they they're going straight for the the hardcore act, and they're getting aroused by what they see on a computer because real women and girls can't can't compete with that. Uh, I heard a young woman say recently, uh, her last four Tinder dates, she said they went for my throat without even asking. <laughs> You know, so as you say, where is that sensuality, that slow burn, that slow unfolding, that slow discovery, which was once such a source of, of joy? That's being uh, eroded by porn uh, conditioning and porn socialize, socialization. And what hope is there of them knowing what the real thing is, is like when they're being sold this commercialized, industrialized, version of, of sexuality for, for, for the profit of, of some global industrialized porn company, you know? It's, it's knocking healthy sexual development uh, out of our young people and it's a, it's a tragic thing. Um, 
you know, what does it do to, to, to real love? You know, again, that might sound, sound cliched, but I, I think it's a, it's a fair question. This is the first generation to grow up seeing rape and sexual violence before even, even their first kiss. And you've mentioned a couple times the phrase porn culture and not mm. just porn as in, mm. um, porn itself, but can you mm. talk about, see, I, I go, I go back and forth as to whether I think it's more harmful to have, I, mean, I have to say, I have not seen a lot of hardcore porn. I mean, I, I, I've not seen a lot of porn in general. Um, mm. and, but I go back and forth as to whether it's more harmful to have this sort of hardcore porn or also the everyday sexualization that we see in, say, advertising, where they use women's body parts to sell cars, because that's yes. everywhere. That's on a billboard that you see on your way to school. But I guess yes. porn is, is ubiquitous, too. Anyway, so can you talk a little bit about porn culture, what that means and, and what, you know, where advertising yes. fits in, where all these other parts fit in? Absolutely. So by porn culture uh, at Collective Shouts, the movement that I co-founded a decade ago, we're referring to the the embedding of objectified portrayals of women and girls at, at every level of society and culture. Advertising is a, is a big area, of course. So if you, well, certainly here in Australia, we have floor to ceiling portrayals of of women in porn, what we would call porn inspired poses in our family shopping malls. So we have a big campaign right now against the CEOs of those shopping malls who are facilitating porn themed portrayals of women in spaces where they would encourage families to come. And these male, these male CEOs identify as male champions of change and male champions of change pledge to stamp out sexism, not only in the workplace, but at every level of society. So we're pointing out, well, you can't call yourself a male champion of change and at the same time, a host porn-themed portrayals of, of women in your shopping malls. It's hypocrisy. It's double standards. Um, we see it in hyper-sexualized porn-themed T-shirts for our our boys and, and young men featuring semi-naked, uh, almost completely naked women on them. Uh, we see it in violent video games, which suggests that violence against women is a, is a form of entertainment. Grand Theft Auto V, classic example, how to secure a prostituted woman and then you have sex with her and then you murder her to get your money back. And I meet very young boys are playing that game. We see it in so-called lads mags in service stations, uh, 7-Eleven. We have a campaign we're launching this week against 7-Eleven where you get, you know, Slurpees and Chupa Chups and Donuts and you've got uh, your, your porn-themed magazines there published by Bauer Media uh, right at kids' eye level offering, quote, fresh young flesh and presenting an idea that uh, women enjoy being sexually harassed. Uh, recent magazines have themes relating to upskirting. You know, this is a crime, certainly in Australia, upskirting, and and yet it offers pictures of, you know, celebrities who some paparazzi has been able to take a photo up their skirt. Why are we encouraging illegal behaviour? You know, right now in Australia, the Australian Human Rights Commission has a national inquiry into sexual harassment in the workplace. At the same time, these magazines, which are available everywhere, encourage, encourage sexual harassment. They have, you know, supposed interviews with girls who say they love being out in public and having their bums grabbed. How much they enjoy it. You know, this is all fake, of course. But you see how this undermines our efforts to, to stamp out sexual harassment. A sexpo, which is the peak event of the Australian sex industry, uh, is allowed to advertise on school buses, complete with the websites of the sponsoring companies of Sexpo on kids' school buses. If kids look up that link, they will see hardcore sex acts through a live streaming 
uh, webcam sites. So this is what I mean. It's embedded in the culture. They don't have to be looking online uh, for it. It's 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 everywhere. Just to be clear, did you just say that um, there are advertisements for a um, for basically a pornographic site on school buses? Yeah, it's a porn trade fair called Sexpo, and it's the peak event of the sex industry. And we had a campaign against them a year or two ago where they listed the sponsoring companies of Sexpo on the, the ad on the school bus. Uh, so the the name of the sponsoring company and the website, you know, of course. So I'll tell you something. It makes it just normal for kids to see. If they look up that, they would see live-streamed hardcore sex acts. So I'll tell you something that really makes me mad, which mm. is a lot of times when – when I when I raise any of these issues, mm. sometimes there will be um, sort of third wave sex posi types who will yeah. then call me a prude. Yes. So can you, and Gail yeah. Dines responds to this by saying, "Well, that's like saying that somebody opposed to McDonald's is against food." That's right. Yes. And can can you also respond to? I mean, every everything you've said goes mm. against that whole prudity notion. But can you just shoot that one down mm. for me too? Yeah, look, we get this all the time by those with vested interests in protecting business as usual who don't want any restrictions at all on the sex trade, who want no protections to stop children entering torture porn, sadism, rape porn sites. So the people that make these claims have vested interests. That's the first thing to say. The second thing to say is that we are not opposed to healthy sexuality and certainly not to girls uh, developing their sexuality in, in healthy ways. We're, we're opposed to uh, the sexist grooming of girls and a culture that tells girls uh, you are only your bodies and you are only a certain type of body. You have to be this kind of body or you're not hot enough and not good enough. So what we're trying to do is dissect a culture which is actually uh, sex negative. It's actually harmful to girls' sexuality. What, what's happening is harmful to healthy sexuality. It's not sex. It's not, it's not positive at all. So, uh, that's what, that's the, that's the distinction. It's, it's, it's not objecting to girls' sexuality. It's objecting to, uh, a, a, a top heavy porn version of sexuality and a false version that tells girls that empowerment and liberation come with acting in these highly, um, pornified, pornified ways that you have to, act in these pornified ways to get approval, to get accolades, to get likes on Instagram. So that's the, that's the distinction. So at one point in in one of the articles you wrote, you told me, and this is a quote, a young woman told me, I mean, you didn't tell me, you, you wrote, a young woman told me that on dating sites she lists under fetish wanting yeah. to stare longingly into someone's eyes and to take sex slow. She that's said if she didn't put those desires in the fetish category, they wouldn't warn a second glance. Yes, that's what she told me, yes. Yes. She, she had to list these as crazy off-the-charts things for for them to get considered because that's considered weird now that you might want to make love slowly and look and look longingly into someone's eyes. What a, what a tragedy that is. And I have more young women now telling me that they have given up dating They've given up using dating apps. Uh, they are going to seek uh, fulfillment in other ways because what is on offer is so so unattractive to them. And uh, sadly, even even younger girls are telling me this now. They're not interested in what uh, the boys have to 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 offer. It doesn't appeal to them at all. I'm thinking about something else too. Are there You've, you've written how, um, labiaplasty requests, which, that, that's, I'm sorry, labiaplasty, that word should not exist except in cases of like fire or, you know, mm. the, you know, where, where somebody, I mean, labiaplasty should not exist, but mm. labiaplasty requests have tripled in a little over a decade among young women aged 15 to 24. Yes, that's right. 
because they think there's something wrong with them uh, because of uh, Brazilian waxing and because of what boys are seeing on on porn. Boys are expressing um, disgust with a uh, a vulva that doesn't look like what they've what they've seen, and it's a tragedy. You know, we condemn female genital mutilation when it happens in other countries. We're actually allowing it in so-called you know Western liberal democracies and selling it to to young women as 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 empowering. So. They think there's something wrong with them where there's nothing wrong with them at all. And, you know, they'll end up with damaged nerve endings and a, a loss of sensation uh, to get this certain look. And the cosmetic surgery industry is, is having to, happy to prey upon the body angst of, of our young women um, and girls. I don't know how anyone could hear that and not recognize there is something very wrong with what pornography is doing to young girls. Yes. I mean to 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 make them to make them dislike their something so mm. intimate as their their own genitals. Yes. Is, is is unforgivable. Yes, well they're internalizing that that hate, aren't they? They're internalizing the messages from porn and what boys are telling them. There was a Channel 4 documentary in the UK a few years ago where boys were shown images of women um, from porn and then they were shown images of real women and the boys expressed disgust at real women's breasts, uh, which, you know, can naturally uh, sag over time. They're not as, as pert and as, as perky and they almost threw up when they saw images of women with pubic hair because they thought it was so disgusting and they're the, they're the boys that our young women are, have to, to to mix with. Recently, a teacher told me a story. She said that she asked the Year 7 girls, so in Australia that's the first year of high school, she said, what do the Year 7 boys talk to you about? She was curious as to what kind of discussions uh, were had between the Year 7 girls and the Year 7 boys. And the girls all responded in unison Porn. They talked to us about the porn they watched last night. And the teacher is very surprised by this and thinks it can't possibly be true. They must be exaggerating. So she goes over to where the Year 7 boys are sitting and asks them, boys, the girls claim that you talked to them about the porn you watched last night. And they, they didn't deny it. They didn't, they didn't deny that that's what they talked to the girls about. So, of course, this is going to play out and impact girls. They talk about being groped at school. They talk about walking down the corridors and having uh, guys uh, try to touch their breasts, try to rub themselves up against them. Uh, I was told of a school in Queensland in Australia that it had to sexually segregate the school buses because the girls refused to get on the bus with the boys. They were sick of the groping, the jokes about their bodies, the photos being taken surreptitiously up their skirts, down their blouses. They were sick of being harassed just to get home from school. And uh, so the school had had to sexually segregate the buses. This is how it's playing out. Daily sexual harassment. A lot of girls say to me, we thought that was normal. We just thought we had to endure it. We thought we had to put up with it. We didn't want to be called a bitch or a snitch or a dog for confronting that that behavior. They're so used to being wolf-whistled cat called out of cars to be harassed uh, you know on the streets just going about their daily lives why should they have to endure that and that's why we try to encourage uh, young people to act uh, personally and to act collectively politically to to, to try to change this uh, for the benefit of, of them and of course the generation uh, coming up behind them so did did I just grow up in a bubble? Um, because honestly, if in high school, if I went on, I, I'm thinking of dates in high school and what we talked about. We talked about teachers we liked or didn't like, or we talked about the movie we just watched, or we talked mm-hmm. about. Um, I remember, you know, taking a walk with with a girl in high school, and, and it was at night, and we talked about the stars. And mm-hmm. I mean, I, I I don't I don't. I mean, was was I in a bubble, or have things actually gotten that much worse? They have gotten that much worse. Yes, there's I mean, no is, doubt. About it. Was that your experience in high school too? 
Oh, yes, my experience was similar to yours, actually. I mean, you, you would, you would, I don't know, I mean, we would talk about how much we did or didn't like Mrs. Carlson, the English teacher, you know? <laughs> yes. I, I, I mean, I, I don't want to romanticize it too much. There were yeah, still I don't, don't, bad things I mean, going on. Yeah. But, but the, the, but this, um, I mean, and there was cat calling. I remember, I remember hearing yeah. some, some males cat call some women. Yeah. Um, um, but it, it, it uh, and there's another thing I want to say. You, you talked about Brazilian waxing and this reminds me, I used to teach at a college and mm. one of the exercises we would do, or not exercise, one of the things we would do in one, one of the days of class is mm. we would have a poll day where you can basically ask whatever question you want and people will answer honestly and no judgment. So like mm. how many hours a night? Everybody says they study, you know, eight hours a day in class or for all their college. And mm. so we say, really, how much do you study? How much do you sleep? How often mm. do you drink? Uh, and one of the questions that, that would always be asked mm. by a female student would be, so A, what do women think about not shaving your legs? This is pre, pre, pre-porn culture days this way. It wasn't mm. shaving your pubic area. Shaving your mm. legs. What do women mm. think about shaving your legs? And then what do men think about dating someone who shaves your legs, shaves their mm. legs? So first mm. off, notice that they're talking about grooming the women, not the men. Mm. But second, they would always ask me what I would think about this. And I would always say, honestly, by the time – and it was in terms of relationships. I said, by the time I find out whether a woman has shaved her legs or not, we've already pretty much made the decision as to whether we're going to go forward with a relationship. I mean, that's that's completely yeah. irrelevant. Who, I mean, that's, that's mm. trivial. So – now it gets even more intimate. It's gotten, my point is, it's gotten even worse since the 90s. 90s it was shaving legs. Now yeah. it's shaving pubic area. And That's I can't not... imagine, I can't imagine, I cannot imagine going on a date and mm. going, God, it was so great. We had such a nice time. It's so wonderful. And now we're yeah. going to become more intimate. Yeah. Oh, that's disgusting. I mean, I can't, I can't imagine that. No, I know. I'm going to give you uh, four other examples that, parents and a grandmother told me recently uh, a grandmother from the city where I'm from Canberra told me that uh, her 10 year old granddaughter was waiting at a bus stop and a boy came up to her and said uh, do you do anal a mother told me that her 8 year old daughter got a note in her school bag and when they were unpacking the school bag they found this note that said are you ready for sex? Uh, an eight-year-old boy, this is a quote from another mother, an eight-year-old boy told my eight-year-old daughter he wanted to quote F-U-C-K-U hard and a ten-year-old boy told my ten-year-old daughter that he was going to break in and rape her. Now those four accounts came to me in about a 24-hour period on Facebook about three, two or three months ago. So this is all all recent. So there's there's not much romance or intimacy in, in there, is there, is there, Derek? No. So so we have about ten minutes left, and I don't mm. want to go to to the positive news yet. Mm. Before we go to positive news, what do we do about this? What 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 can be done to mm. stop this uh, juggernaut of yeah. of of horrors and of mm. creating? Um, creating, creating, I don't want to say creating monsters, but creating, while creating, creating rapists and rape victims. Let's just say that. Yes, well, it's certainly contributing to, to rape culture. And we are certainly seeing rising rates of, of violence against women and particularly in a younger cohort of, of men. So what do we do? We need a whole of community approach. So, Obviously, uh, we uh, need uh, parents to be informed and, and equipped to help their young people to uh, navigate a sexed up world. So I do a lot of work with uh, parents as well and, and with educators, uh, helping them to address it in education settings. Uh, we need to help young people themselves uh, to make healthy decisions about bodies um, and relationships. One of the most common responses I get from, from g girls is that uh, we're allowed to say no and not feel bad about it. And I'm sorry, I have gone into the more, the more positive there. Uh, but, 
you know, to help young people to be equipped to challenge the scripts of, of pornography and to choose something uh, better. Uh, but then we also need our governments and our regulatory bodies to step up to the plate. You know, at least the UK is trying with proof of age requirements to help protect children from uh, entering porn sites. We have nothing here in Australia. Uh, there's been very little political will to address this. Uh, the sex industry is very powerful and uh, makes threats whenever a politician mentions trying to protect kids. Uh, the sex industry rains down fire and brimstone up, upon them. So it takes very brave politicians to step out and say something on this. But our, you know, there's there's no protection, and surely we should be taking a, a health approach here and protecting uh, the vulnerable, primarily our our kids, uh, from torture porn, rape porn, incest porn, sadism porn. Uh, we should find be able to find some common ground at least there. And uh, as I said, a whole of of community approach. Parents, educators, health professionals, mental health experts, child welfare, child development authorities, and then our politicians who are supposed to uh, act in, in our best interests here in Australia. Our governments and regulatory bodies have offloaded uh, these these things to, to, to us. You know, the whole advertising industry here is self-regulated. Uh, which means the advertising industry gets away with a, with a hell of a lot. And the whole system works on complaints, which means me and my friends are exhausted complaining all the time uh, with rarely a satisfactory uh, outcome. So why should the best interests of uh, corporations and the sex industry come before the well-being of, of the community? Why should governments offload their ethical responsibilities to, to citizens uh, who often don't have resources, you know, we, we run a non-profit movement at Collective Shout, uh, but we're doing all of the work that our governments and so-called regulatory bodies have failed, have failed to do. So, uh, as you were talking there, suddenly something hit me that you said earlier in the conversation, mm. which was that you said that some boys are spending six hours a day on porn. Mm. And my mom would have killed me if I would have spent six hours a day just watching TV. <laughs> I mean, there, there is a larger problem here too, not just pornography, yeah. but also screen culture and screen yes. time. Absolutely. That, um, my mom would have said, okay, either A, you're mm. going to go outside and play, mm. or B, you're going to go do the dishes, but you're not going to watch TV for six hours. You can watch TV, you know, one hour, two hours, whatever it is you're going to do. But yeah. it's, it, it, it suddenly strikes me, six hours, that's, that means six hours mm. also not spent outside, not actually interacting with a human being at all. That's correct. Boys are taking their, com their cues from computers rather than real human beings, and so it affects their ability to, to relate. Uh, body language, eye contact, conversation, those kind of things. And I'm going into primary schools where boys are falling asleep in my class. And some of these kids are, you know, really young, 10 years old. I asked them, what were you doing last night? And they'd been online all night, you know, and then they're supposed to go to school and learn and play and develop in healthy ways. They're exhausted and Often the parents have no clue or the kids are just running rings around the parents in terms of the tech. Uh, they might hand in their SIM card from their phone or hand in their phone, but they've got another phone or they've got another SIM card. You know, they've managed to circumvent uh, family family rules. And so uh, really, we're seeing this play out. Mm. So really what we need to do, as well as dealing with pornography, we also have to deal, we also have to talk about addiction. Yes. Um, because it's very clear that there's an addiction to screens and an addiction to porn going on as well. Yes. I'm meeting more young men who are experiencing compulsive porn use, and it's wrecking their lives. I had a young man tell me recently that uh, he was first exposed to eight, and uh, 
from eight to eighteen, compulsive use. It worsened after about the age of eleven. And he said to me, "It sucked the life out of me. It sucked the life force out of me. I, I had no energy for for anything else, and everything else in his life suffered. Activities he might have done before, which were uh, life affirming and helped him to flourish, he cut those activities out. Friendships, time with family, time engaging in sport." And, and it changed him so profoundly and so significantly. He ended up in more uh, brutal places. But what helped him to get out was a recognition that it was destroying his life. But he also started to read about the treatment of women in the industry. And that weighed on his conscience that he was uh, contributing to a, a global industry, you know, trafficking women into this I- industry, um, that he uh, had, had, had become part of the the problem and that that weighed on him and uh, that helped him to 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 get out but yes i am meeting more and more boys um, struggling with compulsive usage and and wrecking wrecking their lives and let me know when you want me to get get a bit more positive and i can tell you well this would be this would be a good time i was just thinking that yeah. you know this 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 last 44 minutes or whatever has been pretty heartbreaking and yes can you and I, I I'm not one who says that we always have to have a happy ending, but but in this case, mm-hmm. can you can you give us some sort of positivity or some light at the end of some tunnel? Yes. Well, look, I need to not just for your listeners, but also for me, because it's very hard doing this work every day. And if I didn't have some positive stories to tell, I don't know that I could continue it because uh, I'm traveling, you know, around the country for weeks at a time, speaking on these issues, and some days. I think, gee, I wish I had an, I wish I could talk on another topic. But look, I have uh, more young women rising up and saying, we've realized we're allowed to say no. We don't have to be pressured to do things we don't want to do. We have a right not to be sexually harassed. Uh, The law is supposed to protect us. We have a right not to send um, naked pictures of ourselves. We don't have to endure this. And that gives me hope when more and more young women say, we're not going to put up with this anymore. We have a right to say no and not feel bad about it. I'm also meeting more young men, and I have two that have just joined my team, who want something better. They they are rejecting this toxic messages about masculinity, these brutal and callous messages. They want to have healthy relationships. They want to have healthy friendships with women and, and girls. They're sick of that whole kind of jock culture. I don't know if you say that word there. You might say frat culture, uh, which is embedding new codes of conduct in, in men and, and boys. So I'm meeting more young men now who want to rise up, who don't want to be passive bystanders, who don't want to be victims of the sex industry, who want to speak out personally and also collectively uh, politically, that joining collective shout, leading campaigns, um, challenging porn culture in all its manifestations, and you know that that gives me hope. When I have young men come up to me and say, "I heard you speak a year ago, and uh, I stopped using porn straight away," I recognised what it was doing to me, but I also recognised that I'd become a patron of the global sex industry, and I didn't want to be like that anymore. And so those boys. Uh, give me hope. I have more boys telling me they call out the bad behaviour of their peers. Uh, they step up to, to speak out against sexual harassment. Uh, so those stories do give me hope that change is possible. Well, thank you for that. And is there is there anything else you want to talk about in you know any any websites you want to talk about or any other organizations or mm. well here's here's the thing too so that is there anything else you want to talk about in the last minute and also um what do you want for both women and men older and younger to do mm. in response to hearing this interview mm. well in terms of website naturally i'm going to invite your listeners to visit collective shout dot org where we uh, run all of our campaigns we're also on uh, facebook and twitter and Instagram, and I am as well, melindatankardreese.com. Uh, I have 
a public profile Facebook page. I'm in Instagram and, and Twitter as well. So if people want a better idea of our work and how we do it, how we mobilize people to speak out, uh, to bring about cultural transformation, uh, they're the, the two best places to go. I'd like us all to realize we're in this together. You know, if we want to, if we want a better world, if we want better lives, this is uh, something we all need to engage in is uh, challenging harmful uh, cultural messages, harmful cultural ideas, challenging the corporates who, who profit from exploiting the bodies of, of women and girls, uh, challenging the sex industry, challenging those in, in power who stand to gain from leaving things as they are. And we might pay, pay a price for it. We do pay a price for it, but at, at least uh, history will record that we tried. And I commend uh, all, all of the other uh, groups working uh, globally, my colleagues around the world who are working working to, to challenge uh, porn culture, to challenge objectification, sexualization, to challenge rape culture and and violence against against women. And it's, it's, it is actually an, another joy of this work is to connect with people who are taking action globally uh, to try to, to try to change this before it's too late. Well, thank you so much for all of your tremendous work and thank you for being on the program. And I would like to thank listeners for listening. My guest today has been, been Melinda Tankard-Reist. This is Derek Jensen for Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network.